everyone. <laughs> I'm um, just so happy to be here with you today. And I also want to thank Parnassus uh, for inviting me to come and read today some selections from my book of poetry, Picnic on the Fault Line. Well, you might have noticed that I'm not only holding a book of poetry, but I'm also <laughs> holding my cello. <laughs> And that's because I have had a lifelong career as a cellist. And um, I think I know a lot of you here, so you might know that I played with the Nashville Symphony for 37 years. And I taught music. I played a great deal of chamber music. And um, I've also been very active in the recording industry here, uh, playing a lot of sessions. I see some of my session playing friends here today here and there, so. <laughs> but the reason I have my cello is because of that long career as a cellist, there is a musical thread that runs through much of this poetry. Um, so I'm hoping by interspersing some music with the poetry that not only will the music connect with the poems, but also it will allow you a little bit of mental space to let the poems settle with you after I read them. So I'll read and I'll play, and uh, then if you have any questions, and then we can sign and we can eat and we can just have a big party. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm standing here holding my instrument. One more along that line. It's actually called strings. A family of instruments, all with bows and four strings, emerging from dusty cases, Requiring true patience and tolerance, early efforts, all scrapes and shrieks, tuning struggles, recalcitrant pegs, frustration at attempts to glide horsehair <laughs> on steel. In time, hands learn their place as a connector to the heart. The reluctant left hand centers into the pulsing of the pitch, tiny contact point of bow on the string draws forth music from the player's soul, and the listeners become one in beauty. Tradition. 
three chords and the truth. <laughs> John's mom wanted us to know his nimble guitar picking was entirely self-taught, the hit of his shows. Dylan's hair was wild and free, blissfully hatless. With a sheepish grin, he cranked up his volume up past three. <laughs> Wayne reveled in his daring, all boots and jeans and had a, a first timer in this ritual of melodies and verse, his whole family there to hoot and holler. Jude's jeans were carefully torn. Her makeup was perfect. Her cleavage artfully arranged. It rested gracefully on her old guitar. <laughs> I'd give anything to have you back. <laughs> Each arrived with a guitar in hand, but only one's was graffiti laden. Markers, stickers, dad's homegrown wisdom, and a telling moment when he turned it over and set a beer upon it. And it was his table, too. <laughs> Struggling to get the G string in tune, another remarked, I could use a tuner, but that's kind of like a man asking for directions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> another casserole. Instead, the funeral home messenger handed me a paper bag, dad's glasses and neatly folded pajamas. Cremation had been his choice. I shouldn't have opened the bag. I pictured flames. Those last physical remnants unleashed the sad hurt, coalesced into tears and tears of pain and loss. So, my mom and I lived together that summer at the family's summer house. We had been six there, all together in laughter, in tension, and that dance that families do. Then I had sat on the porch, watching the world go by, reading one book after another, basking in the glorious gift of summertime. Now we were just two. And this summer, so different. My mommy struck down by grief, but trying to put on her old face, trying to stick to the routine. Daddy's presence walked through the kitchen and the garden, wafted out of an unopened book, and left us stunned and leadened in his absence. Me, in my first year of adultness, uh, but not quite knowing how to do that, living again with my mom for one last time, 
but not knowing that either. I write this at 56, and she is 93, and from here I know I should have savored that last summer of mother-daughter closeness. But no, I was my father's daughter, so eager to be independent, while actually freshly divorced and known from loss, I had to find someone else to lean on. A young man who would let me take his arm while working hard at my playing and forgetting. The grief of youth becomes energy, eager to be spent, scrubbing floors, hauling heavy things, while working hard and running through wet grass and not stopping. I agreed to be the helper of an ailing friend of the family. I bathed her aging body and I washed her dishes with only a sponge and a bar of ivory soap, precisely as she directed me. <laughs> a blur of practice rooms and concerts masked the dull ache in my head and soul. Tchaikovsky resounded from the wooden balconies and I played in the music competition at the summer's end. And I came in second again. <laughs> now I see second as a respectable accomplishment. But back then, it just meant that you had lost. <laughs> My mother was disappointed along with me. I knew she wanted me to win. And later in the day, she went to the farmer's market and brought back some mushy strawberries. I said, those don't look very good. And she said, that was all they had, and I do know how you love strawberries. And I saw the love in her wanting to give them to me. And I grew a little wiser that day when I thankfully ate the overripe strawberries. Oh.